Professor Julie Fortney does in her diction class, okay. but she doesn't teach an entire curriculum. Okay. But, so that's where I think the students get Italian and German. Okay. So they get it through music rather than through language. Correct. And it's probably mostly for singers because they need to be able to pronounce the words Correct. when they're when they're singing. Correct. Okay. How how have you felt about the diminishing of modern foreign language in an academic curriculum? First of all, I felt very sad um, because I think it's taking away an important component of a student's ability to process the world. Okay, obviously for us, we're closer to Spanish-speaking people, and so logically, Spanish would be the language that we would learn. But when I was in high school, Spanish was secondary, it was always French. Mm -hmm. But at that time also, French was the international language for diplomacy. Right. If you were going to be a diplomat work for the State Department, you would expect to know French mm -hmm. or be able to get along in it. And, and even that has changed. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that um, in the United Nations, French is still very much a, a component of languages right. that, that are in translation. But no longer, I think probably English has supplanted all that, don't you think? Possibly. Possibly. But now I do know that, for example, when one gets a passport, the three languages are English, French, and Spanish now on the passport. So it's, it's clear that we haven't gone much beyond that. If anything, we have reduced our component worldly knowledge of language or language instruction. Right. Was, the, was, was that an economic thing at the, at here at the university, or was that just because there wasn't a demand for it? I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think we did some research on that and found that German had diminished in importance and necessity, and French and Spanish maintained their uh, level of importance and necessity throughout the world. So in other words, for us to create graduates, for us to have graduates with a second language knowledge, for us it seemed to be French and Spanish were the best choices. Um, so it wasn't a question of we don't like German, for example. It yeah, wasn't it was just a question of the, the man. some research we did that showed that uh, French and Spanish were still in secondary schools, and uh, students were coming into the university setting already having taken some of those one of those two languages. I believe also earlier times, um, Dr. Sawyer and religion did Greek, and they still do Greek. They still do. They Greek. Still, do, still do Greek and Hebrew, and that's just for. Religion majors, is that correct? And correct, but I think a student could take that if they wanted to, and if they wanted to, um, for some reason, not take French or Spanish, they could take Greek or Hebrew okay. here at Mars Hill. And I noticed in the, in the catalog that you, you have a, a in, uh, I believe it's in, in the French minor, that the course may be taught in French or in English, you have an option, is that correct? Uh, perhaps in certain courses, but for the most part, the language courses here are taught in the target language, we call them. So they taught in French and taught in Spanish. And uh, you teach all your classes in, in Spanish? I do that plus some English. I interject with English right. for understanding. Right. I understand. I do what we, we call in language learning spot checks. 
Okay, so if I'll be speaking in Spanish, I'll stop for a couple minutes and ask the students, are you getting what I'm saying? Are you understanding right. it? So it isn't entirely in, in Spanish okay. or that I know of in French. It was very disappointing for me. At the time when I was studying languages in high school and college, they were taught in English. Right. We, never, we never got a chance to speak the language. Right. And when I went to Europe, I was not prepared. Right. I had a, an intellectual knowledge of the words and could read, but I had no right. sense of how one talks. Correct. Uh, and and the, the language you learn in a book is not going to be you know, the language that you use on the street. It was very, very disconcerting. You have been a part um, of something that's a fairly new phenomenon in this country, and that is English as a second language. Mm -hmm. How long has that program been in effect here? We probably, I would say approximately, um, I would say 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, okay. um, I was on the search committee to hire Dr. Destino. Right. And um, I was part of that initial group that looked into the ESL program. And um, that we now offer a major in that. How, tell me how that works. Who, who, obviously, it's designed for folks who don't begin speaking English as a native language. But how, how does it work here on campus? Well, how it works on campus is the student can major in ESL, and they are asked to take a second language, whether it be French or Spanish. It's not required, okay. but they learn through the ESL program uh, approaches, methods that deal with second language learners, we call them students who are in the K-12 system, for example, whose first language is not English, um, who are trying to work through the system as well as the parents, too. You can do a major? Uh, I'm, I'm, judging, I'm sure we can, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure it's still on the books, yes. I haven't checked recently, but I think we have okay. a major in ESL. Tell me for numbers, how many Spanish majors are there currently? Well, that fluctuates, of course, but I think at this time, this cohort, we have a, a probably uh, eight to nine Spanish majors. Is that very predictable? Is it predictable as a number of Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very much interested also in the fact that you as a, a teacher of language are dealing also with classes in English. For example, you were teaching Don Quixote for, to, right. to freshmen. Correct. And these are, these are freshmen of it. You know, generic open course rather than a specific class. How has that been to teach a great work of Spanish literature and how has that been? Well, the, first of all, I teach, it, I teach it in translation and I teach it from the point of view of not so much the language but the ideas behind Don Quixote and the idea of the dream that he has. So in other words, I use that text to springboard into giving the students a chance to dream. And so it isn't really much, it isn't so much for me anyway, it isn't so much them contrasting English with Spanish. So in other words, I don't introduce the Spanish text to them. I used to do the English text, but for me, it's what's in the story that I want the students to learn. Do most students already know that story by the time they get to college? It's curious. A lot of them seem to understand a little bit about that. Most of them probably haven't seen Man of Mancha either. That's, that's <laughs> one thing that we talk about. How many of you have seen the story and the movie yeah. and the play? And some of them have. In fact, some of the, if we have, a, if I have a theater major or, or musical theater in my freshman group, um, they may have already heard about that. That way. I know that for most young people, for a while, that was the way they learned about it. And when I was right. a kid, you learned about it because there was a thing called classic comics, ah, comic okay. books, right. that told the stories of the great classics, and yeah. many children learned about Don Quixote that way. Mm -hmm. uh, do you teach, uh, is there, uh, along the way, do you teach, because um, theater is my background, do you right. teach courses where you focus on Lope de Vega and Calderon and Actually, we do, yes, that? we do, we do. I just finished a course um, this fall on, uh, mass, uh, it was a survey of Spanish literature from Spain, and we did a work by Lope de Vega called Sheep's Well. I don't know if you're familiar yes. with that. Yes. Yeah, we talked that with yes. a very famous monologue by Lorencia who talks about him that I'm being cowards. Is that Ovejuna? Oh, Fuente Ovejuna. Okay. Fuente okay. Ovejuna, okay. right. Okay. right. But we do look at the Vega, um, and I choose theater to, to teach the idea of uh, you know people in a small town coming together to fight off the evil of the leader who's trying to lead them down the wrong path. And so, but we do that. Yeah, it's fun. Now, you grew up. Did you grow up in Wisconsin? I did. Yes, I'm I know this native. Okay, you have your degrees from Madison University, yes. of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Your undergraduate and your master's degree. Correct. Um, what made you choose Spanish if you grew up in Wisconsin? It's, a, it's the funniest story, it really is. Um, when I was a sophomore in high school, I took my first Spanish quiz and I failed it. And I was so ashamed of myself that I went back and took it again and I got 100 on it. And after I took the second time around, I realized I'm not that bad at it. I wasn't that bad at it. But people ask me that question all the time. What is the connection with Wisconsin and yeah. Spanish? Um, and to my knowledge, there isn't one really. You know, In those days, in the 60s and 70s, there weren't Spanish-speaking populations there. 
Uh, yeah, you know, uh, so you have a natural aptitude for I do. it, and you just fell right into it. Right. I noticed when you were in college, you did your junior year in Spain. Correct. Um, what was that like? It must be very shocking for you to go suddenly out of... Well, what you said was interesting because I had learned book Spanish for so many years. Right. And was it Castilian? Were you taught Castilian? No, I wasn't taught Castilian. And um, another funny story I have about my Spain trip was on my flight over from New York to Madrid, I had my dictionary and I was looking through all the words <laughs> in the dictionary trying to yes. re realize, well, I got to know these words. Yes. And I do remember that distinctly as one of my first exposures to it. What and was the year like when you were there? Probably the best year of my entire life. Why? It, it formed me into who I am today as far as the Spanish language goes because I was exposed to so many interesting things. I studied art history. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I studied art history for a year in Spain at the Prado Museum. Was, the, was, this a, was this a part of your plan that just happened? No, it just happened because I went to the Prado Museum and I fell in love with artwork and there was a class that I could take called The Art History of Spain. And, and you it. spent a year in the, in the Prado? And well, I studying at the Prado, yeah. I'm yeah. so envious I can't yeah. stand Meninas, it. The, the Greco, Meninas, the Greco, yeah. Velasquez, Meninas, yeah. uh, El Greco, Goya, yeah. um, Rubens, a lot of the, well, a lot of the Spanish Dutch painters, for example. And you went over to Bolivia too, to yeah. see, see the, the great artwork there too. Yes. What was it like spending all this time in that museum? Well, it, would, it became so second nature to me. In other words, I would go there uh, at the same time every day to meet my tutor. You know, there's a small group of us. And um, it just became part of my life. You know, it was, I'd wake up, go to class, and go to the Prado in the afternoon for my tutorial. You know, oh, that's wonderful. Two semesters. I, I spent, I had to live in a little pension, is that what you say? Uh -huh. Just up the road from the Prado. Okay. And, uh, we go. I was only there for a very short period of time, and terribly frustrated because there's so much to see. It's oh, like, there is. It's like yeah. the Louvre. You can't just go right. in a short period of time, and you want to see everything, and, and you can't do it right. so quickly. And when I was there, the highlight was to see Picasso's Guernica. Yes, it was the original it was there. Tour. It was it was hanging in the museum. It was that was its home, so to speak. Is it still? I don't think I remember. No, it's it was there. It's, it, it's in Madrid, but it's at the Reina Sofia Museum, okay. which is down the street from the Prado okay. right now. But it, when I was there, it was in a, in a uh, building adjacent to the Prado. And that was its home, the Guernica, and I, I studied that as well as part of my art history. How have you used that experience in your subsequent work? Well, I use the Guernica, for example, when I teach uh, Hispanic culture. Right. And I talk about how it's, I can give them students the history behind it, how it's, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's three panels. I, did, I didn't and know that. It's, not, it's one giant, it's an enormous panel, but it's divided right. into three, three parts. So I teach that, and that often tricks the students into thinking, wow, it's really just one piece. And I say, yes, it is. But did, did Picasso plan it that way? Or was it? Yeah, he did. Yeah. I was just reading yesterday, speaking about that, that um, the Chagall made big canvases that were so big he cut them. He uh, would do right. triptychs out of one can't even go the other way. That's interesting. And yeah. I had not known that possibility before. The, the Guernica was not painted as, it was painted on one piece of canvas and stretched on the frame. Okay. Um, and so he, and it was charcoal and it was black, white, and gray. Yeah. Who, who are the, uh, the artists that you found in the Prado most impressed you? Goya. Why? Because Goya paints in different media. He paints in, in charcoal. Yeah. He paints with paints. Um, he has different periods of his life. Like if you know Picasso has his blue period. Yeah, for yes. And the red period. And the red period. Yeah, sure. And Goya is the same way. And what fascinated me about Goya's paintings, or his life, is he was completely deaf by the time he, by the time he died. So when he was painting his works in the early 1800s, he was completely deaf. And um, he wasn't able to hear anything. And so there's been a lot of theory about maybe he had an extra ability, an extra eye, so to speak, when yeah. he couldn't hear anything, but he was painting. He painted war scenes, for example, that are very famous. And the so, he painted great canvases of the royalty. Correct. The families of the great royalty. Correct. Family. His horses aren't good, though. If, yeah. If you look at his horses, yes. they, they, don't, they don't really add up. <laughs> no. But, but you he focuses get, on the character of the human. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, have you used, have you encouraged your students here to, to explore art after your experience in art, to begin to look into those those kinds of things. Sure, I do. In other words, I use very I use a lot of visuals in my class when I teach art history. So I use uh, um, a lot of colored slides, for example, that the students can see. Right. And hopefully, I think, as you know as well, we as educators, we want to plant what, what they call it. We want to plant a seed. Oh yeah. You know, show them a, a, an important piece of. Ticket. For example, I can I can take a section of Guernica's of of, Goya, of, of Picasso's Guernica. And focus on just a an eighth of the of the, of the entire uh, pat canvas, right. and show them that there's just detail that they would normally miss. And hopefully, I'm look, forcing them, not, well, I'm allowing them to look into the work in through many different angles. Yeah. What a fascinating experience mm -hmm. for you. Um, how 
you, you came back and you finished a degree in, in Madison. How did you get, uh, was there time in between the masters and the doctorate? No, I went straight through. Went straight through. Mm -hmm. And how did you decide on Gainesville and University of Florida? Because my mother is a native Floridian. Uh -huh. And so um, she always, we grew up hearing stories about Florida and she wanted to retire there. And so I kind of went through those lines. My mom and my dad, they were heading to Florida to retire anyway. And Gainesville, they retired to a place called Ocala, Florida. Yeah, yeah. And so Gainesville was about 45 minutes away. And so it became very convenient for me to have them there. And then I was at the University of Florida and did my PhD there. Did you like that experience? I enjoyed it uh, tremendously. Because I worked, I worked in literature, in Latin American literature, and my main advisor was, was a world authority on my area of literature, and I was very humbled to be working with him, actually. And so you were in the right place at the right time. Correct, right? yes. You exactly. lucky twice. I know, that's right, exactly, yes. That's, that's uh -huh. incredible. Yes. I, I know that your dissertation was on the, the vampire figure mm -hmm. in, uh, in Latin American Correct. fiction. Um, I'm so curious. I mean, outside of Romania, people don't talk about right. vampires. Except that I know that it is a huge, it is a huge focal point in Latin American literature. I know that. Uh, I think most of us are aware that there are so many films uh, in, right. in Spanish That's that right. deal with this term. Right. How did you lock onto that? It was interesting because in my PhD program, we had to choose our main field of study. In my case, it was Spanish, Romance languages. We had to select a minor as well in the PhD program. So my minor was American literature. Um, uh, of the 20th century. And I took a class in the English department on horror literature. And it was on vampires, Frankenstein, and werewolves. And I remember... Were you already interested in that before? No, I wasn't. Okay. I was taking this class, and we were looking at the vampire figure, and I, the light bulb went over my head, and I realized, I'm going to do my dissertation on vampires in Latin American literature. And I was surprised when you said that. And I went to my advisor, and he said, this is a great idea. You need to follow up on this. Was so it fun? It was extremely fun, yes, it was. Did you watch lots and lots of films? Too many. Too many. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet. Well, you know, even the soap operas uh, in, in uh, Spanish often deal with this topic. Oh, very, yes. Uh, so. Fun, fun. Yes. Fun. yes. So, uh, mm -hmm. I should ask you then, after you finish your degree, you got mm -hmm. your doctorate, how did you find Mars Hill? Well, that's curious because um, I went... ABD. In other words, I was writing my dissertation, yeah. and I, I first I applied for a job at Warren Wilson College, and I got a job there first in, 19, in 1994 as a visiting professor at Warren Wilson College on Swannanoa. Mm -hmm. And it was only for two years, and at the end of two years, I began looking for another job, and I found an advertisement for Marcel, and I applied. And um, I waited and waited and waited until I got the note in May of 1996 that they sent me a note saying, we'd like you to come interview for the position. And I did. And so you already had a sense of the mountains before you right. actually came yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, was it what you thought it would be when you got here? It was more. It was much more. How, how was it more? Well, I had never heard of Asheville before. And when I got to Asheville, I remember I flew in from Gainesville. It was in the spring of 94 when I, was, uh, first, when I first got here for my interview at Warren Wilson College. And I remember landing and seeing the mountains, and it was really beautiful. And I remember this is a really uh, awesome place to be. So you've been happy here in all this I years. have, yes. Right. yes. And you actually came to the campus then in 1996. Correct. 96. Yes. And you're a full professor. Mm -hmm. And yes. you have gone the whole, the whole range of seeing, I'm trying to think, Dr. Bennett was just retiring. And Correct. Mac, uh, Max Weiner. Max Weiner was coming. So you've been through almost three presidents. Correct. To that period. Yeah. Um, have you, how have you, oh, or you, you obviously didn't know that, because he was mm -hmm. just leaving, but um, how have you perceived the changes in administration over the period of time you've been? I think the administration, since Dr. Lunsford has been at the helm of the university, I think it's become a more open place. It's just a, because again, Dr. Bentley, I mean, Dr. Lennon was only here for a while, I That's think. Like five like, years. Five years, yeah. yeah. And so I don't think he was here long enough to really put into place what he wanted to do for his vision. And I, I don't think any president can do that in five years. It takes a longer amount of time. Longer time. And now Dr. Lunsford has been here probably maybe 15 years, I think. Getting close. Yeah, getting close to that time. So the changes I've seen was, I, again, I don't think there's been much change because, like I said, Dr. Bentley retired when I was hired around that time, 95 or so. Dr. Well, yeah, Dr. Lennon, well, he came in, Dr. Lennon came in right when I came in, in 96. That's correct. And so Dr. Bentley, I never got, I never met him actually. I never, I just heard of him. I never met him. But 
Again, I think Dr. Lennon just didn't have enough time for Marcel to, to create much of a footprint, as it were. Do you feel, do you feel the administration supports the, the languages? Do you feel you have support of the administration? I do, actually, because I think Dr. Lunsford, being an educator himself, realizes the importance of that, because he right. comes from an education background. That's right. So I think, and he was uh, K-12, too, so I think he understands the importance of the language, and so I feel supported in that sense. Yeah. You led me into my next question about K-12. Mm -hmm. I know that you are the faculty coordinator for K-12 in Spanish. Right. How many students among the uh, students on campus who actually come through your program to teach Spanish? Very few, very few. Why it's, is that? It, that? I don't know. I think it's the, I think overall, it's because the K-12 system is undergoing such drastic changes right now. People are leaving the profession because there's not much, there's not much. And I don't speak from an experienced K-12 teacher at this point in time. Are you speaking primarily of North Carolina or in general? I think in general. I think North Carolina in definitely has its own issues with, with K-12 education. But I also think in general, people are leaving the profession for pay reasons, um, for the, uh, the common core, they call it, for yeah. students having to learn you know, a certain way. So I think people are leaving the profession and heading um, into other fields. And so for K-12 licensure and second languages, that also has been affected by the change that's happening nationwide and statewide. Yeah. That makes me sad in a way. It does. Because it makes you wonder what the class is going to be like, school's going to be like. Well, I think it's going to go towards a more vocational model. I think um, even K-12 systems, and maybe even the high schools, are going to go towards more um, trade-focused. Does that bother you? It bothers me tremendously because it, we're losing we're losing sight of the liberal arts, not at Mars Hill, but I think in general there's this loss of, of vision of lot the liberal arts that I think is kind of it's sad. Well, the truth is, I took many courses, and I'm sure you did too, that you would not have taken had they not been in a curriculum that was you were, had signed up for. And I can honestly say that I really didn't take any class along the way that I didn't get something out of. Correct. Correct. Um, right. I'm sure there were teachers that I didn't always admire, but basically the material. The material. That's right. The, the material was was the important thing. Yeah. While you've been here on campus, mm -hmm. you've you've done over a period of years you've been here, you've done a number of, um, you've gone all around the country doing, uh, presenting papers mm -hmm. and doing lectures and so forth, mm -hmm. and you've worked rather directly with the Appalachian College Association mm -hmm. a number of times. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that association and what you have done that you have really admired in that configuration. Right. Um, my first accept, my first contact with the ACA, Appalachian College Association, was probably in the late 90s when I first got here. And um, colleagues from two other schools, Wheeling Jesuit and Warren Wilson College, and I from Marshall College, we created a database for foreign languages through a grant with ACA. And so that was my first exposure with ACA and um, uh, its tremendous leadership, um, I think, over the years. Um, and I'm, her name escapes me now, the, the former leader, of, uh, director of the ACA, uh, Brown, her last name was, I think, but I can't remember. Um, anyway, but... Um, is, it, is it still based in Kentucky? It's in Berea. Right. Berea, Kentucky, that's right. So my first exposure with it was through a grant that I received with two other colleagues to develop a database slash website for foreign languages. And, um, yeah. and the, the database, tell me, what, what was its purpose? Well, we, were, we provided audio-visual materials for students in second language classes. So, okay. We created okay. these secondary sources, some primary sources, and we, uh, this was in the days, this was in the late 90s, remember, right. we weren't where we are now. Right. So we had to use CDs, and we burned a lot of CDs with information on them, and we sent them out to schools to try, and that kind of thing, a lot of the ACA schools. Um, my other work with ACA has been through, over the years, trying to develop an internationalization experience for all the colleges. I think there's 50 colleges within the ACA. Um, but we wanted to develop a um, study abroad program through the ACA for all the Appalachian College Association students to go on. That never went off the ground, unfortunately, but we, I was working on the, the committee within the ACA to do that. And they're still going strong, aren't they? Is they are. Um, now, the AC, it's not like I remember it, though. What's happened? Why has it changed? I think, and I, I may be wrong here, but I think a lot of the, the large funding has faded. There was a, a large grant from the, the, Car the Carnegie Mellon, I think the Mellon right. Foundation. They originally, I remember, were very strongly funding it. Do you think that's faded? They, I think, I may be wrong, but I think that was what, in the days when I was involved with ACA, that was huge. I think we still get some money from the Mellon Foundation, though, not through the ACA. There's still fun, money's, money's from that. Yeah. Over the years, you've, you've spent a lot of time on Chronica Royalis. Right. Tell me about that. What was it about that book from Argentina that... That, that grabbed you. Tell me about that book. The book is about two families that are uh, noble families, um, and the book doesn't take place in any specific time or place, which is interesting because there's no dates ever mentioned in the book. 
there's no places ever mentioned in the book, but it has a cast of characters. I mean, I've always thought that it would make an outstanding play. And has outstanding, anybody done it? No, no one's done it. Has it been filmed? It hasn't been filmed either. And so in other words, I could see, I could see uh, 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 screenplay for this, this work, actually, could right. have envisioned that. Have I gone to that point yet? Not really. No, I haven't. But I could see this turned into a very uh, magical slash fairy tale kind of like uh, work that would have all these incredible characters. There's a vampire character. There is a, a fairy character who is like a fairy godmother. There is a character named Hercules who's the, the originator of the family. Um, and each chapter has its own uh, collection of characters and there's 12 chapters in the book. What drew me into it was I read it in one of my graduate classes and I fell in love with it. And since my director of grad, my PhD was Argentinian, he was able to point me in the right direction to do research on it. Did you go to Buenos Aires while you were there? I did, yes. I know you spent time in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, how much travel were you able to do while you were in South America? Quite a bit, actually. I spent a month, I mean, excuse me, I, mean, I spent three months in Venezuela with the Rotary Foundation. Yes. I was a Rotary Scholar. Yeah. And then that was in 1996 before I came to Marseille, actually. And then through my sabbatical, through the ACA, I was able to go to Argentina and do research on my book, on the translation of Cornicas Reales. Tell me about the experience while you were in, in Venezuela teaching. What was the university experience like there for you? How different is that from us? It's a different experience because it's not the same. There's not cohesiveness like there is here. There's not campuses per se. Um, Colleges around town? Uh, there are institutes, you mean speaking about here or no, down there. There, there? There are institutes of languages around the city where I was in. There weren't colleges right. per se. There was one university where I taught a class on, on a short story, for example. Um, but the, re the difference that I saw was that there's no cohesiveness. The students would come to class and they would go home. They lived at home. It was a commuter concept more than anything. And many universities in Latin America are like that. If it's true it's in France. I, when I studied in France, I found that there was no campus as we know campus. Correct. The, you would call the, the school or something, the institute or something, Correct. around town. Correct. Um, one of the things you've done here, which has caused a lot of excitement for people over the years, is your tours to Mexico. Correct. Um, how many of those have you done? Um, I've done uh, seven trips down to Chiapas, Mexico. They're always the same place? Yes. Is it because you've set up an arrangement there to go with how does that work? Well, I have, a, I have a contact there that I work with through um, Asheville Sister Cities as well. I'm on the board for Asheville Sister Cities. Explain that to us. Asheville Sister Cities is an organization that fosters international understanding through uh, contacts between cities in, in different countries. Um, it was started by Dwight Eisenhower in 1954, and um, it's a world phenomenon now called Sister Cities. So it matches cities in one country okay. with cities in another country. And Asheville has two sister cities, one in and San Cristobal, where I take the, the trips, and another Mexican city in Valladolid, Mexico. But I work really through Mars Hill and Asheville Sister Cities to take these trips. How many people have gone basically on all these trips to each time? If I could count, I would each time or like total? Each time. Each time. Both and each other. Um, I think an average trip would take about 10 people. So I, I would say maybe 100 people I've taken down there over the and years. And you've invited people outside of students to Correct. Go. And have you had many takers? Um, I have actually. Uh, the most recent trip I took uh, was an Amaris Hill alum who was a, she went. She and her husband went, and um, they heard about the trip through the Mars Hill publication. Yeah. and they saw it in there. And that they, was that. That was wonderful to have them on the trip. Yeah. Good. And how long are you there when you go on these trips? Usually ten days. Ten days. Do you worry when you're there because you become the you become the head man. You right. you're, you're the one who's the father figure. Correct. Uh, and everybody goes to you if they've got problems. Are you anxious well, lately? It's interesting you say that because over the years I've noticed that, tra well, again, the student travelers have become more savvy. They've become less, I don't want to, well, I will use this word, the student, the student travelers have become more independent. And not, not provincial. Right, exactly. They, in other words, I find myself not having to look after them as much as I had in the past. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That over the 15 years or so that I've been doing that, I just I find that the two student travelers are just more able to be on their own now. Is it because of... You know, I wonder about that, Is actually. it because of commu uh, computer immediate access to knowledge everywhere that people are more tuned in? Maybe. Yeah, it could be. And I think it's because two of the students now can find a cyber cafe, go inside a cyber cafe, jump online, and be in touch with home right immediately. Right, right, right. But I, back in the day, in the 90s, we didn't have this phenomenon yet, and so it was still by telephone. Is, is there still some reason to have fear 
to send a student off to Mexico for a junior year? No, I don't think so. I think the misconception is that all of Mexico is dangerous, and when yeah. in reality it's the northern part of the country where a lot of the drug problem and trafficking right. are taking place. Where I go is the southernmost state of Mexico. And so in my in my entire times there, I've never we've never had an issue with anything such as robbery or you were never any afraid assaults. Either. Never afraid. No, uh, and I've been that taking my trips down there. Good. Yeah. Do you still plan to do that? Oh, it always drives me back. My most recent trip was in August. This past August, I went. So, so yeah. you will keep doing it then as long as you feel energetic and enthusiastic. That's right. And have the takers. That's right. Out. Exactly. Yeah. 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 One of the things I know that you've been active on campus is um, Alpha Chi. Correct. Which, for most people, uh, we should explain as an honor society mm -hmm. fraternity. Um, t how does it work, first of all, that people get in Al Alpha Chi? Right. right? And then tell how to. Yeah, Alpha Chi is a national honor society. It's called an honor, it's a national honor scholarship society, actually. And Alpha Chi um, members are in the top 10% of their junior and senior classes. And it, I like to call it the Phi Beta Kappa of smaller schools. Okay. Because it is the top academically uh, achieving students. Is it, is it an automatic membership once you reach that top level or? Well, it, I, I, I get a list from the registrar here at Mars Hill and I, I figure out that they give me a list in ascending order from the top GPA yeah. down. Right. And it's always the 10% of juniors and seniors. So for example, if the junior class has 190 students in it, I'll, I'll go through the list and pick out the top 19 right. based on their ranking. So it isn't so much based on a specific GPA, it's based on the top 10%. Top 10%. So we've had students who have 4.0s, we've had students who've had maybe a 3.8, but some schools do the actual GPA, but we restrict ours to, to the top 10%. And our charter was first um, granted in 1970. So it's been a long time. Been a long time. How, how did you become the faculty advisor? Well, uh, Dr. Jim Lemberg uh, was here for many years, as you know. Yeah. Um, he came to me when I first was hired and asked me if I'd like to be the uh, faculty advisor for it. And you said yes. I said yes, that's right. And you've been doing it ever since. I've been doing it ever since, that's right, yeah. You know, it's the danger of saying yes. You I know. When, you, when you're very young, you don't get away from it. I know, it. that's right. Uh, so I received, I, I got the reins, so to speak, from Dr. Jim Lindbergh. Right. Do, do they do projects, or are they, is it just a recognition? Well, they, sh they should do more projects. That's one thing that we're kind of lacking in at Mars Hill. We're trying to get the students more involved. And so um, that's going to be down the road, I think, a little bit more. So. It used to be that the college marshals were the high-ranking students. Is that the same group? Yes, it is. They're the top. That's the top honor at Mars Hill. Alpha Chi is not the top honor. Um, being a marshal is appointed is the top academic honor at Mars Hill. Yeah. It used to be, and I haven't noticed this in recent years, that they were the ones who wore the, the, uh, the, the uh, banner sort of mm -hmm. flash thing um, to uh, Usher graduation. Correct. Do they still do that? Correct, they do. Um, and they, they bring, for all the uh, commencements, for the convocations, they're the ones who lead everybody in, see everyone see everyone in the auditorium. That's it's right. Okay. Yeah, and they wear the sash. That's yeah. right. So they're visible, highly visible. Anybody who sees those young people know, mm -hmm. okay, these are all very bright students. Aren't Correct. They? And it often overlaps. It often occurs that a lot of those students are Alpha Chi members, too. Yeah. And Alpha Chi members, and it can also be marshals. So it's not always the case, but for the most part it is. I know, I know that another thing you've done on campus over the years, you've been the spokesman um, for AIDS. Correct. And, and the drives for money and for recognition of AIDS Day and so forth. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in this project? Correct. Um, HIV, well, World AIDS Day is always December 1st um, of every year. And during my many years as with my freshman seminar, um, my students, our project was to make posters for World AIDS Day, and they were often on, they were on display in the library for December first. So, and what students would these be? These would be my freshman students, freshman students. in a freshman seminar, okay. correct. And um, but anyway, I got involved because I had lost several friends to AIDS over the years, and so it became a real personal thing for me to kind of educate people more about HIV and AIDS in general. So it became. Did, did you get a lot of campus support? I did actually. I mean, one of the first years I did it. Um, it wasn't so much money we received, but we received no, no kickback from it. In other words, there, it was clear from the top down that I was doing this, and I, I think I, I received a lot of support. So I think the president and vice president would often go to see the posters in the library right. and um, would see that we've done uh, some work on that, on increasing awareness. Because AIDS obviously was associated with gay people earlier right. on, in the time you've been, you've been here in a significant time for young gay students. Correct. Um, have you noticed a change, a visible change of easier times for gay students on campus? Um, I, I want to say yes, but I think among the student population it's still a, it's still a struggle. I think campus-wide, uh, 
acknowledgement of the GLBT issues is larger, but I still think within the student population there's still some tension. Is it there's because of conservative growing up backgrounds kind of thing? Or? Correct. I think students come in from their homes and they've been told certain things um, by LGBT people and et cetera. Not all students, but some. Right. Do you see do you see that changing at all? Do you see students growing past that? I do, yeah. I'm always hopeful about that actually. Um, you're has still been, been, yeah. has, been, has the administration been helpful in that regard? Yes. Yes. In other words, the president knows of my efforts during the years uh, to uh, increase awareness about that. So that's not going to happen. In, it's not going to block for me, so to speak. So, right. Yeah. You are writing and, and doing papers all the time. What are you working on currently? Um, my most recent work is on a, a nun from 16th from 17th century Mexico. I just gave a paper on a nun who wrote out in favor of women's rights in 1691. 1691. 1691. Where was she? What country? Mexico. Mexico. She was a Mexican nun, and um, her name was Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, and she published uh, some writings that supported women's rights. Women's rights in 1691. From a nun, too. From a nun, no less. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So that was my most recent. That was in November. I gave a paper in Durham um, at a national conference. Yeah. Are you nervous when you do these papers? Not at all. Not at all. And the only thing I'm nervous about is if my research is solid enough, because yes. it turned out at this, at this when I was on this panel, some of the world experts about her were in the audience, and I knew that. Oh, I knew that, and I just went fine; it was no problem, and I got no comments or questions. No, no comments. No, I mean, but that's either good or bad. I'm not yeah. sure which. Yeah. You know. Do you have a mentor in your life somewhere that you run a paper by before you actually present it? I don't actually. However, my graduate school uh, thesis director, I'll often email him, especially during my book project, the translation. Um, I would often email him with questions, and so he he and I are very close now as friends. And so I'll often email him saying, "This is what I'm doing." I'll send him a paper, and he'll give me some feedback on it. You know. Have you become that for somebody else yet? Um, I want to think so. <laughs> I want to think so. It's, yeah. it's, it's interesting at the point where you realize suddenly, "Hey, I'm the one who's being looked at as a mentor for." And I know you are a mentor for many students. I realized that over the years. But I, I think there's been students who've approached me and said things like, well, you know, I really learned a lot in your class. Or um, LGBT issues. I've had a lot of students yes. come back and say that you've increased my awareness uh, about the LGBT situation on campus. And that makes me feel good. Good. There's an issue going on right now in this country which is very troubling. Um, and I'm sure that this tape, when the, the day of this tape, will be looked at, I hope, at some point in the future. Yeah. And we'll think, could this be true here in December of uh, 2015 right. that a candidate for the presidency of the United States has avowed that he would, if elected, you know, ban all Muslims from this country. Mm -hmm. I know you have done papers and you've done discussions on diversity, Correct. and particularly about Islam. Correct. Correct. Um, how, how are you processing this? <laughs> how are you processing this? I'm not sure yet. I mean, I look at it from the perspective of we are all immigrants. In other words, that makes me sleep at night. <laughs> well, no, but it's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true that we are all immigrants, and I think the candidate is looking for a very specific reason. I think the candidate, for one thing, likes to hear himself talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that a lot of people agree with you on that one. Uh, but it, no, from my perspective, seriously though, because I've studied the, the cross, the crossing of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity in Spain, yeah. for example. I did a whole seminar on that, yeah. and um, I just remember uh, learning that. Each has its value, and one should not be looked at higher than the other. How did your talk go, your presentation, when you did that one on that topic? How did right. it go? If I remember correctly, it went really well. It went over, but you're preaching you know. to the choir. Correct. That's exactly right. I think. Uh, In academia, we do that. We, we do. You know, we do. Writing plays, you're writing plays for people who are coming to theater. That's right. That's for the most part. part. For the most part. Right. You're exactly. Right. Uh, and the same is true with giving papers at conferences. They're to kind of know the subject. You know. Right. The trick would be to figure out how to get to the, get that information to the people who need to hear it, who that's don't hear right. it, that's right. exactly. who don't that's hear right. it. Right. Yeah. But I guess, again, my take on that is I think that you know I look at uh, his whole approach as being very one-sided and almost, um, almost with one eye closed and one eye squinting. It's not really looking at the issue. He's just looking at a specific group of people and targeting them um, almost out of his own hatred or fear, I think. Right. Um, do you, do, you, do you think that young people here, for example, at Mars Hill today, hearing what he says, how are they responding to this? Do you know? Well, again, like we said earlier, there could be some, there could be some who are hearing this from their home churches and home families that it needs, you know, this is a good thing. But I can't say all of our students are that way. And I don't think, I want to think all of our students are more enlightened than that, that are coming from a more diverse background. Right. But 
Mike, there could be, you know, there could be uh, churches out there today, well, I know there are churches out there today who are, are agreeing with that whole stance of not allowing Muslims in this country. But um, I'm hopeful, because I think our student body is so diverse here at Mars Hill. I think we have such a, a wide diversity of students. We're going to have people from all spectrum, and I think that's important. I think that's important, too, to have all points of view at the table. Right. The most conservative ones, the most progressive ones, everything in between. To me, that's necessary. That creates... Well, maybe in, in, in theater, you know that it's a creative tension. Oh, yeah. You have to have it. Right? You have to have a creative tension. Oh, yeah. If you don't, it's not worth writing. It's not worth talking yeah. about. You know? do, you feel, do you feel the faculty at Marshall University is, um, is it a liberal faculty? I think so. Yeah, for the most part it is. And that's true everywhere you go, though, really. Um, I mean, there's, that's pretty much the case in all the universities and uh, institutions of higher education. What, what impresses you about the faculty? What impresses me, I think, is the first of all the diversity of faculty. I think that we all come from such different backgrounds, and I think that that impresses me. And I think, you know, I as you know, I've gone to, I've gone to years and years of conferences and just attended all over the country and some around the world. And I come back a lot of times, or I go to these conferences, excuse me, and I hear people talking about how bad it is back on their campus. And since I've been here, I tell people this: since I've been, I live in I live in Asheville, so I have to drive in every morning. Yeah. Not one day have I come to Ash to come to Mars Hill ever not wanting to be here in my entire time here, in my 19 years at Mars Hill. In other words, every day I've wanted to come to campus to teach. I've never ever jumped in my car and said, I don't want to go to work oh, today. Work. Because yeah. of my colleagues. That's a huge validation. So you, you respect your college, colleagues and Correct. you admire your colleagues. I do. If you could change something about the faculty status on campus, what would you change? I like it the way just this way it is. But if I if I had to change something, gosh, that's a good question. I I would probably change. I would probably try to increase how we see each other's research and, and, and work. In other words, I think that we all have blinders on. People in the humanities tend to think humanities. People in the sciences tend to think sciences. People in in the specific disciplines don't tend to look outside of their world as much as they need to. Um, if that makes any sense, I think. Oh, it does. It does. We all are isolated in our discipline. Yeah. And the, the, way we, the way we are located geographically on campus has to do with I was always up in the theater area and did not come to the lower part no, of the No, that's right. So I didn't get yeah. to know the scientists that, and those folks very well. At meetings, you get to say hello. Correct. But you don't see them on a regular basis. Correct. And you'll probably set it up around Cornwell and don't Correct. get to experience this part of the campus Correct. as well. Correct. Because we're on the south part of this that's part right. or the yeah. western part. Yeah. Um, if, if you could change one major thing and go to Dr. Lunsford, who is the president, and say, Dr. Lunsford, this is what I think you need to do here, and hope that he would get it accomplished. What would it be? I think, I think, for me, it would have to be increasing the value of our physical facilities on campus. Ooh, interesting. I think we have two, as you know, we have two new buildings going up, the nursing yes. building and That's then the right. day hall, That's right. which I think are big steps, but I think and I speak only from my, my building is falling apart, for example. I think there needs to be a wider vision of building up. The, we need a student center, I think, that's what works something. I understand center. the student center is going to be refurbished or redone. I understand. Correct. But I still think we need to have, and Day Hall, I think, is going to include this, like a, a cafe in the first level yes. and then have access to the theater. Own the theater, it's going right. to be a new uh, interest to the own theater. So if I could go to him, I would probably say, please, let's earmark some funds for increasing the value and the, um, the usability of our facilities on campus. Um, that's it's hard to get money from donors to do repairs. Correct. They want their names, obviously, on buildings and scholarships. 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 Or whatever. And it's hard to find money for maintenance and upkeep. I know that. If I may, can I add something yes. else to that? I think another thing that I asked Dr. Lunsford for is to have an open fund to allow students to do research, I think. In other words, there is money available, but I think it's hit or miss. I think that if we could have a fund to allow students to attend conferences, allow students to do active research, whether it means time away or with another faculty, we do that. We do. We currently do that. But I think there needs to be a little bit more money for students to do their own research. Do, do you send students who are Spanish majors somewhere during the course of their time with you, maybe a semester somewhere? Well, now that you mentioned it, I think that's one, <laughs> I guess, Another thing I would, I would probably talk to him about is guaranteeing guaranteeing a study abroad program for each student who graduates from Marshall College. Some schools do that. Yeah, they guarantee a semester abroad, for example. It's built into the tuition. Built into the tuition. Mm -hmm. That's right. Some schools do that. Have you suggested that to Dr. Lawrence? I have not. I have not. I need to get on your agenda. 
It is, I think, and there's discussion about it, but I don't think it's gone up as high as his office yet. My, when I went, because like you, I was fresh out of a small geographical area, which I only knew, that, but my base got I knew. When I went to Europe to go to France, to, in my case, to study, it changed my life forever. Oh, it does. I had right. no idea. I had no perception of this country because I lived here. Right. And you suddenly look at your own place and you think, my goodness, I have all this and didn't know I had this. I think most young students perhaps don't get that. That's right. They grow up here, they see only this, and they don't understand what this country is like from, right. from a, an outside view. Because right. um, the, students, the students who go abroad and come back, that's one of the first things they say is their whole life's changed. The students I've taken to Mexico, for example, come back, and one of the things that they write about and talk about is they've never had experience of that before in their lives, and they come back and their whole view has changed. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. There's been a criticism in recent years in academia, high academic colleges and universities about, um, what's the correct term? I forget what the correct term is. It's, it's where there are too many A's being given and there's no longer a delineation of quality. Everybody expects to get an A. Right. How, how, is that something that's still common? Great inflation? Yes, great yeah, inflation. Great inflation. Yes. Yeah. Is that something you encounter? I, I, myself, no, but I think from just anecdotally, I think that does happen. Um, I want to think we're changing that, but I, I still think it's a big issue out there. I really do. Because um, students look at their education as being negotiable now. Yeah. And they want to try to say, well, I did this, so therefore I should deserve that. But again, I can't say that's true for all students, but because greater inflation exists, I still think it does. Yeah. In the 19 years you've been here, what changes have you most noticed in the freshmen coming in? Um, I think the biggest thing I've noticed is, um, quite interestingly, parent, more attention on the parents to what their education is worth. It used to be that I would, if that makes any sense, then was I would, I, during the SOAR sessions, and I, I'm not with the parents during the summer SOAR sessions, but I get, the, I get the feeling that a lot of the parents are much more in tune now because of the price tag involved with education. In other words, okay. they want to so get more they're value. Following they're going. following it more okay. than I remember. That's okay. right. That's what I see here. Yeah. Do you, do you get a sense from the young people coming in that because of media, you've got computers and smartphones, that, that the way they approach not only study but life is different? Can you get them? Can you reach them? Yes, because I, in my class, for example, I allow my students to use their cell phones to use for dictionaries, for example, Spanish okay. language dictionaries. So I, they often are surprised when I say, get out your cell phones and you're going to use them in class today. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll email them the night before and say, bring your tablets or your computers to class tomorrow. You're, you're an exception, because I know teachers that have baskets inside the door. Put your cell phone here before this right. class starts. But I actually allow my students to use them because they use them to look up words, for example. Yes, that's right, exactly. Yeah, so I find that useful. But as far as reaching them goes, I think what I find curious in that here at Marcella is their students do not read their emails. I think they're just bombarded with so much media these days that they have trouble picking and choosing what they want to look at and read. So I've had students where I've emailed them, and then a week later they said, I've not read my email. That surprises me. Yeah, I don't think that I they, because they, they're in a phone all the time. I know, that's right. But evidently, it's priority. It's selective. It's selective, yeah, selective. that's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. When all the professors tell the students, remember to read your, e your Marshall email. And like I said, I've had students who two or three days have passed and they have not checked their email account for Marshall, and I've had an important message on there, for example, for a class or something. Right. You know. Let me go back to something you said a while ago. You, you said that you feel that there might be a negative aspect of, of campus in that disciplines tend to stay in their areas and they don't cross-pollinate much on campus, professors and departments. Right. What would you do to change, what would you do to change that? Well, I think if we could all go to, if we could come together with different colleagues in different disciplines and go to conferences together, multidisciplinary conferences, that would help. Meaning conferences that aren't for the sciences, aren't for the humanities, conferences that are for learners. Does that come down from the dean? Where I think that, that, where does that come from? The dean? That would have to come from the dean's office, the, the educational dean's office. Yeah. And I think he's very for that. I think he's a supporter of that, too. One of the things Christy uh, and I who have been doing uh, over the years in, in talking to, to uh, all the folks who've been a part of this, mm -hmm. this series, we've discovered that there are incredible things going on among individuals that nobody knows about. Correct. Uh, and the classic example for me was Dr. Kenneman, Noel Kenneman, yes. who was doing all this incredible research and writing well known overseas, but nobody knew him here. Right. Uh, you are doing all these things. Nobody knows what you're doing unless you probably are your own PR person. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Scott Pearson was talking to us recently about all the things. Nobody knows this. Yeah. Um, how can that 
change? It's a good question. I don't have an answer for that. I really don't. Um, I think it would be a chance. As you know, we have SLAM every semester. Right, but that's the students. Exactly. I think we should have a faculty one. Well, uh, Dr. Lunsford said there is a day where faculty achievements are recognized. But is that what is that enough? It's just a, it's just a, it's just a gathering. It's not yeah. it's not any. This is my paper. This is what I'm going to talk about. Yeah. There's, what happens um, at that gathering? Uh, that happens where they the, the committee that brings together all the faculty who publish something. And it has to be publication, it's not presentation, which I think is not, I think we should change that. I think they should just... That seems, that seems elitist. Exactly, yeah. It's only for those who publish. So then the word goes out, you send us your information of what you've published. And I've once said, well, I've given three papers this semester. No, that doesn't count. It has to be a publication. I, I think it's harder to do a, a public presentation. Sometimes it is, that's right. Exactly. For some people, certainly. That's right, exactly, yeah. Uh, can you get that changed? I can, well, I can ask about it and see what it is. Get on, get on a crusade to get that right, exactly. I, I think you need to do that because I think that diminishes. Yeah. It really diminishes. More people are going to get probably something out of a presentation. Correct. Right. Of course, you can read a book anytime or a paper anytime. Right. Um, yeah. 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 That surprises me a little bit. That, it does. That, that, that whole recognition is for publications only. Yeah. yeah. Are there any people publishing here on campus? There's a handful. Yeah, there's a handful that are doing books and have done books already, but not many. But that's not encouraged, is it? It's not. That's right. Scholarship is encouraged, but it's not encouraged to the point where you have to publish something. It's right. just if and you the want to. And the college, the university would probably not be happy to give uh, class release time for you to write a book. Probably not. That's right, exactly. Because yeah. you're needed for classes. That's right, right. exactly, yeah. That's right, exactly. But there must be some way to have a, a happy blend between teaching and, uh, and uh, scholarship along yeah. the way. That's right. um, where do you want to be in five years? Marcel, I want to be here. So you see yourself finishing out your career here. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, I finished my career. I'll finish my career here. Um, I think I will be. Yeah, I'll be at Marshall still teaching what I love, just because I love it so much. Yeah. You Students, know, faculty. Barbara Walters always asks the question: How do you want people to remember you, or how would you like people to perceive your work? Um, how would you like people to remember you and perceive your work? After your time here. Right. I think people, I, I'd like people to look at me as being someone who encouraged um, an open dialogue about issues that weren't talked about in general. Do you have specific ones you'd like to say? Um, LGBT issues, for example, okay. HIV, AIDS, um, Hispanic culture, yes. and also things like artwork and that kind of stuff that normally wouldn't be talked about. You know, um, It's curious. I think years ago they actually, didn't you put on some plays by Calderon in the theater? We, we, I did, mean, we, we have Spanish done it. Lorca, we did a uh, Lorca. Blood Wedding, I think, at mm -hmm. some point. But in the past, there was a there was a sort of marriage between languages and theater. When there was a program where the plays were being done at Clemson, uh -huh, several okay. plays in Spanish were done yeah. down at Clemson, yeah. directed by theater yeah. majors. I think things. I remember hearing about that. Um, yeah. And it was fun for everybody. Yeah. It was fun for our students because they got to work in a foreign language. That's right, exactly. Uh, yeah. But I don't know that that's been done in recent years. Yeah. Um, but that'd be something that I'd like to have my legacy is to, to have, like I said, have opened up a dialogue or conversation about issues that are usually that have been kept quiet on this campus for too many years. But also be a proponent for Hispanic culture in general, given our changing world. And where, you know, yeah, so movies, theaters, drama. Those are noble goals. That's right. Yeah. I hope you achieve them all. I plan to. <laughs> it was great to do that. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Thank, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.